Good evening, everyone. If you would, I'm, uh, I'm going to pray one more time, and uh, you can open your Bibles to Luke 11, and then we'll hop in. Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, I, um, I pray, Lord, and I ask, Lord, for the same thing that John prayed earlier, Lord, for fresh application, um, Lord, that your word would speak to us, Lord. We thank you that it's, it's your word, Lord, and uh, it's not ours, Lord, and your word is uh, truthful, Lord. It's dependable. Lord, it is useful for many things, Lord. And we ask that tonight, Lord, as we go through um, this study, Lord, and these collection of verses here, Lord, that you would speak to us in the way that you want to speak to us, Lord, that you would uh, reveal to us the things that you want to reveal, Lord. I don't want to be anything that, that I say, Lord, but that your word would speak for itself, Lord. Um, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We ask that your spirit would go before us. It's your name we pray. Amen. Awesome. So, if you are joining us for the first time tonight, we are continuing our study in the Gospel of Luke. We're looking at the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And a few weeks ago, we left off towards the end of chapter 11 with Pete. So as I said, you can, you can open your Bible to verse 37. That's going to be our starting point for tonight. Uh, we're going to see Jesus speak with some, as I would call it, divine sternness towards the Pharisees and towards the lawyers. And he's going to really be unraveling their trap. We're going to see this. We know this is kind of a theme um, in scripture. They try to do this all the way up until the point of Jesus' death. So if you will, look with me in your Bible. It's going to start at verse 37. The fastened seatbelt side is on. And let's jump into it. Verse 37. And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and he sat down. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. So the first thing that I love about the Lord is his posture towards the Pharisees. We've talked about it before that we're in the last several months of his ministry and the biggest source of opposition that him and his disciples have faced throughout his ministry is the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But Jesus being gracious and loving towards them, he agrees to meet with this specific Pharisee to have a meal. But also take in mind, remember that the same Pharisee and the Pharisees that he is meeting with ultimately are going to try to convict him and kill him later on. So to understand verse 38, this idea of this hand washing, we first, we have to go back into the Old Testament. So if you would, we're going to jump back into Leviticus chapter six, and we're going to look at a few verses here pertaining to washing. So Leviticus six, this is verses 25 through 27. And it reads, say to Aaron and his sons, these are the regulations for the sin offering. The sin offering is to be slaughtered before the Lord. In the place, the burnt offering is slaughtered. It is most holy. The priest who offers it shall eat it. It shall be eaten in the sanctuary area, in the courtyard of the tent of meeting. Whatever touches any of the flesh will become holy. And if any of the blood is splattered on a garment, you must wash it in the sanctuary area. We're going to turn over a few pages to Leviticus 13 now. Leviticus 13, we're going to be in verse 58. And this verse reads, 58, the garment, whether the warp or the wolf, or any article of leather from which The mark has departed when you washed it. It shall then be washed a second time and will be clean. Next chapter over, this is Leviticus 14, verse 8 and 9. The one to be cleansed shall then wash his clothes and shave off his hair and bathe in water and be clean. Now afterward, he may enter the camp, but he still shall stay outside his tent for seven days. It will be on the seventh day that he shall shave off all of his hair. He shall shave his head and his beard and his eyebrows, even all his hair. He shall then wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and be clean. So let's pause right here. Does anyone see anything in here about washing your hands before dinner? This is only a couple of verses right here. In the Old Testament, does anyone see anything about washing your hands before dinner? I didn't see anything and neither did you. So that's the point right here. There's nothing 
in here that references washing your hands before dinner. So these are just a few examples of ceremonial washing and cleansing that we see in the Old Testament that revolved around touching dead animals or sicknesses or bodily discharges, etc. So there's many more verses that we see uh, in the Old Testament, even in some spots in the New Testament that deal with ceremonial washings. We see this in Exodus uh, with the consecration of Israel. We also see this in the book of Deuteronomy before they went out to battle and they were in the camp. Uh, they were to wash themselves or if there was any sort of uh, bodily discharge that they didn't know about, they had to exit the camp, wash themselves before actually come in. They were to remain clean and holy even before going into battle. But there is no specific verse in scripture that is instructing someone to wash their hands before eating. So we have to ask a question, where does this come from? And what are the clues that we have for this case? So if you would, we're going to flip back to the New Testament now, and we're going to go to Mark chapter 7, right in the beginning of Mark chapter 7. Mark 7 verse 1 reads, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defile, that is, with unwashed hands, they found Fault for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding to, as you would read, the tradition of the elders. So when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received hold, like the washing of cups, of pitchers, of copper vessels, and even couches. Verse 5, then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands. Jesus' response to them, he says, well, did Isaiah prophesy, prophecy of you hypocrites as it was written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain, they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of of men, the watching of pitchers, of cups, and other such things you do. So if you want to mark it down in your Bible, Jesus is actually referencing Isaiah 29, verse 13. So now we have our clue here. We have our context clues as to why they marveled at Jesus, or this specific Pharisee marveled at Jesus. It wasn't because he was breaking some sort of commandment that was established thousands of years earlier. It was because he was breaking tradition. And we know Jesus knew exactly what he was getting into right here. So one commentator writes, I did a little more research on what this Jewish ceremonial washing looks like. And he writes for these ceremonial washings, a special stone vessel of water was kept because ordinary water might be ceremonial, so mortally unclean. In performing the ceremonial washing, one started with at least enough water to fill, as I would put it, maybe one to two tablespoons of water. One would begin by pouring the water over their hands, starting with the fingers, and it would run down towards the wrist. Then each palm was cleansed by rubbing one fist into the other, and water was then poured over the hands again in the opposite direction, now starting from the wrist and going towards the fingers. And a really strict Jew would not only do this before every meal, but they would do it between the course of each meal that they were eating. In addition, the rabbis were taking this very seriously. It was deadly serious for them. Um, and even eating bread with unwashed hands was considered bad. And a rabbi once actually failed to do this and he was excommunicated for it. And then another rabbi, as we see in Jewish history, was imprisoned by Roman officials. And when they gave him his ration of water, instead of using it to drink, he used it as a ceremonial hand cleansing and almost died of thirst. And they regarded him as a hero. So in addition to this, not only uh, hand washing before a meal was bad, but if you didn't do it, the superstition was that you were actually subjecting yourself to demons through your fingers. Um, and this was called shibta, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, hopefully. Uh, but isn't it interesting how sometimes 
how our traditions and rules can really lead to fear, right? When we impose extra biblical ideas into the church and into our walks with the Lord, it can easily make us legalistic in our approach to things. And those legalistic ideas can spread as we see right here with Jesus. So Jews aren't really the only ones that hold some sort of a hand-washing tradition like this. In fact, Muslims also do the same thing as well. So back in 2019, I, I had a privilege to go to London um, to visit our missionaries who uh, many of you know. We had a few opportunities to visit and actually go into the mosque because it was actually during Ramadan. So we were able to sit with these people, watch how they ate, um, ask them questions and different things. And they were super hospitable. They would give us uh, tours of their mosques. And the one thing that I was able to see was their version of a ceremonial uh, washing station. In Islam, it's called wudu. And they take it a little bit further than what the Jews actually would uh, when it comes to cleansing themselves. So you would start with your hands, you'd move to your nose, you'd go to your face, then you would go through your arms, your feet. Basically, you would give yourself a shower as much as you could without actually taking clothes off. So it's really interesting to me that we will go to great lengths and people of religion will go to great lengths to clean the body in hopes that it actually covers everything else. And as we know, it doesn't. So picking up right here in verse 39, then the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup in the dish clean, but the inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside also make the inside, but rather give alms of such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. So we know the Pharisees are great at this. They excel in washing the outside of the cup. Matthew 6, he gives us an account of the Pharisees praying outside loud in public for everyone to see, to remind everyone I'm righteous and I'm holy. I'm doing this in front of everyone. And also we'll see later on in Luke chapter 18, Jesus uses a parable to actually describe a Pharisee praying for what he's actually not. The Pharisee's praying, oh, Lord, thank you I'm not a tax collector. Thank you I'm not an adulterer or a Gentile or a sinner. And this is all just outside of the cup washing, right? Even today, you would go into a cabinet, right? And you might grab a cup and you look inside of it and you might see some of the schmutz that the dishwasher decided it wasn't gonna clean that time around. And immediately in our minds, it is dirty it is defiled and we are not gonna drink from it, right? It might look good on the outside. The dishwasher might've gotten the outside, but it sure did not get the inside. And I remember when I was a kid, I grabbed a cup from our cabinet and I wanna get some iced tea or something. And I remember looking inside this cup and if all you guys know what a thousand legger is, my mom hates them. She'll be on the couch when she sees one with a broom in hand. But I remember seeing a thousand legger just circling on the inside of this cup and thinking how disgusting is this cup. I'm not going to drink from it at all. It was so disgusting. And I think that's the idea that Jesus is trying to get across here. And we'll see more of this. One commentator says, if these religious leaders were concerned about cleansing their hearts as they were their hands, they would be more godly men. And we often look to ceremony or to rituals to cleanse us instead of the sacrificial work of God on our behalf. Verse 42, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. So I want you to notice the woes that Jesus is using here. Yes, he is speaking to them in a harsh tone, but if you remember the prophets of the Old Testament, many times when they give their woes, it is a warning of what's to come. It's a warning of destruction. Prophets like Habakkuk, it's one of my favorite books of the Bible, you see an example of a prophetic woe that is being uh, revealed over um, to the prophet for the people of Israel. And Jesus is calling them out 
on their own hypocrisy, and he's also giving warning. So we know certain Pharisees like Nicodemus and probably some other Pharisees heard and heeded these warnings from Jesus when he spoke like this. It's also noted in history that the Pharisees would actually physically count out grain and herbs and actually take the 10% of whatever they had and tie that either to the temple or the synagogue. And their stature in the synagogues, in the marketplace, it was more important for them having their hearts uh, be there than inside of them and in service to the people of Israel. So verse 44, Jesus mentions graves which are not seen by men as they walk over them. So again, Leviticus 21 gives specific instructions to the priests as to keep themselves undefiled. They're instructed not to come in contact with the dead except their own relatives. And this also extends to not walking over graves nor touching the tombs of dead men. So Jesus is saying the Pharisees are so filthy spiritually on the inward that those who even come in contact with them might as well consider themselves unclean, which is huge. That's pretty harsh. So what are we learning? We are learning that being a legalistic rule follower doesn't bring you any closer to God. In fact, God hates it. Our stature, our titles, our positions mean absolutely nothing to God if our hearts are not in the right place. And this is a reality that I think all of us can find ourselves in at one point or another. You know, when we start to concern ourselves with the inward appearance of our hearts rather than what we present on the outside, we're going to be better men and women and followers of Christ. Ultimately, that's more of a concern than how we look on the outside. And in the same way, if the re religious rulers of the time concern themselves with the cleansing of their hearts, they would have acted and glorified God. So Jesus woes to the Pharisees. Sometimes we think it's just for the Pharisees, but it might as well be woes to us as believers as well. You know, there's a lot of churches, you know, there's, there's church leaders that we've seen over the year. They love their titles. You know, they love being the cool church with the best gear, with the loudest worship and the biggest building. But inward, those buildings show a very shallow level of Christianity and an understanding of the word that leaves people broken and frustrated and lost. And I know some of you probably sitting in here have dealt with this personally. You've dealt with the hypocrisy of churches and some of those scars are in sometimes, in some cases, the hardest to heal. I even think in our own congregation, I think there is a healthy level of regularly examining our hearts with the Lord, with God. You know, do we want to be noticed and recognized for what we do around here or for our titles? You know, sometimes we hang our hats on, well, oh, I'm a, I'm a ministry leader, right? I serve on the worship team. Come on, I serve on the worship team. Or I help out in children's ministry, whatever. You can fill in the blank. And our titles will sometimes blind us, blind us to the heavenly duty that we have as believers, which is we all know is to make disciples of all nations, and I think what's more important is to be known as someone who is marked by the life of Jesus. Because when we leave this building, people don't care what our titles are, right? They don't care what titles we have in here. The most attractive thing that they could see about you or about me is what Jesus has done in our hearts on the inside. And that should be the goal that we live and that we try to model and strive for as believers. That should be our lifestyle. Verse 45, then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us as well. And I cannot imagine being the guy who actually asked this question. I can just see all the other lawyers being like, bro, come on, man. Why did you say that? He's, he's calling them out, not us. Don't do that to us too. And remember, we talked about this before that a lawyer in this context is not the same type of lawyer that we would think in our modern culture, a lawyer in Jewish times was an expert in Mosaic and Jewish law. Verse 46, and he said, woe to you also lawyers. So he walked right into it. For you load men with burdens hard to bear and you yourselves don't touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So burdens that they might've put on people might include something like not walking a certain distance on the Sabbath, 
not tying knots between two ropes, passing things from one hand to the other, and, and more. Even today, if you look at Orthodox Jews, they also practice very strict rules when it comes to Shabbat, right? They don't let people clap. They don't let people um, turn on a TV. They don't let people turn on light switches. I actually saw a kosher light switch. If you believe it, they make those things. I even saw somebody ask on Google, now you have to take Google with a grain of salt. Someone asked if they could flush a toilet on Shabbat and praise the Lord, you can flush a toilet on Shabbat. We would have some septic backed up issues if that was the case, but praise the Lord, you can flush on Shabbat. So the idea is that they are constantly burying people with these rules and they themselves don't follow them, at least not in front of each other. If they're gonna do it, they're gonna do it in private. And this is still going on today. It's still going on in Orthodox Jewish practice today. Verse 47, woe to you for you build the tombs of the prophets and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers for they indeed killed them and you build their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles and some of them they will kill and persecute. That the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the very world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. So the Jewish organization of the scriptures would put Abel first in the line of prophets and Zechariah at the end. So the lawyers in this case, they cared more about the dead prophets who were rejected in their time than the living one who was standing right in front of them. And as we know, we saw this with Jesus when he was in Nazareth, that a prophet is rejected in his own town. Verse 52 says, woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge you did not enter into yourselves and those who were entering in you, in you hindered. So what Jesus means here is that they did not come to the knowledge of God by themselves. So their legalistic approach and the rules that they have set up have now become a hindrance for others who are looking to have an encounter with the one true and living God. That's what Jesus is saying to them here. Makes me think of Isaiah 42, verse six, which says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and I will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. So if you remember earlier in chapter 11, Jesus talks about putting a light under a basket. Pete talked about this a few weeks ago. And this is a grave, grave warning against hindering those who are coming to have an encounter with the Lord, and that's Jew or Gentile. So pushing people to have a performance track with God hinders them from growing in the knowledge of who he is. And this applies to us today as well. So back in the day when I was growing up, my first job following in the footsteps of my father uh, was working at a private country club, worked there for about seven years, all the way through um, most of college. And we would work outside. We were underneath the pro shop. We would do, you know, the golf carts. We would take care of the clubs. We'd do the driving range. We'd help out with events. But one of the cool perks of having this job was we we could play golf for free. You know, private country, we're going to play for free. Let's do it. So Monday was kind of our day to to go and to do this. And I asked one of my coworkers, um, you could be praying for him, um, to come and play golf with me. So we went out. And uh, we started playing and and we had some light conversation and it started to turn into more, let's talk about church and let's talk about religion. And I could kind of see quickly was getting a little bit tense. I'd I'd share my faith with him before, but I could see this conversation was getting a little bit tense. So he brings up to me about his Irish Catholic faith. Some of you are quaking just hearing those words. His Irish Catholic faith growing up and how much he absolutely hated it and despise it. So I asked him why, me being curious, I had to ask him, well, why do you hate it? Why do you despise it? So he tells me this story of every Sunday he would get up since he was able to drive and he would drive to mass. He'd get there at around, you know, seven, seven thirty, the earliest mass you could get, get to. 
And uh, he'd wake up at 6 a.m., get himself all, all nice and gussied up for mass. He would go, he'd, he'd come in the door, he would take a pamphlet, he would sit, he would wait, find an opportunity to go to the bathroom or any excuse to get out, and then he would sneak out the back and leave. And on top of that, not to make his parents angry, he would hide out for several hours in his car so they would think that he actually went to mass. But in actuality, he never did. He just went and grabbed a pamphlet so it looked like it. So the real underlying issue was feeling that he could not live up to the standards, in quotes, of church. And it was more an irritant and a burden to him on his life than it was anything else. He couldn't even stand the fact of stepping into mass on a Sunday that he had to get out as quickly as possible. So some of you might have come from this background, like my friend, and you might know firsthand the damage that legalism has done in your life, or you might be sitting in here and you might be imposing legalism in your own life, and you're trying to live up to rules and standards in order to get yourself closer to God, but as we know, God does not want that. Legalism leads to hiding and condemnation, which becomes unbearable at one point or another. And as we know, scripture says, we're saved by legalism. No, it says we are saved by grace. And the grace that God extends to us is what breaks the bonds of legalism. Amen? And many times we let that legalism come into our hearts, but it's not what God wants us. We are saved by grace. Verse 53. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things. So Jesus has sprung the trap here, right? Lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. So it's crazy because when I was reading through this, I'm like, man, this sounds a lot like the devil right here, right? First Peter 5 tells us the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So the Pharisees here are trying to dogpile Jesus and they are hungry to convict him of anything. Jesus knew why he was going there in the first place, but they try to dogpile him anyway. The New King James, if you're reading New King James, they begin to assail him vehemently meaning that they were forcefully coming at him instead of taking the correction that he was giving them. And what does the Bible say about those who can't take correction? I'm glad you asked. Proverbs 15, 5 tells us a fool despises his father's correction, but he who receives correction is prudent. So Jesus finishes, he gets his little get together with the Pharisees and now he's gonna turn his attention and to address this similar idea right here in chapter 12. So if you'll look at with me, chapter 12, verse one. In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And we know that leaven normally is a picture of sin and corruption throughout scripture. And clearly Jesus is warning them as well to beware of the corruption of the Pharisees. A little bit of leaven changes everything, right? So if someone were to put rat poisoning in a gallon of iced tea, you wouldn't touch it at all. So Jesus is giving them the same instruction here about the leaven and the corruption from their religious rulers. Verse two, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetop. So another heavy warning here. This reminds me a lot of the book of Ezekiel. If you've gone through the book before, where the Lord allows him to see into the temple, to see the wickedness of the priests that was there. And as Ezekiel's digging in this vision that the Lord has given him, he sees more of what's happening behind closed doors. And it goes to show that hypocrisy depends and feeds on the dark. We live in a culture and we live in a church culture that has a lot of hypocrisy and to deny it that there's no hypocrisy in church culture is hypocrisy. So over the years and time and time again, we've seen big church figures, key leaders stumble and fall over their own 
hypocrisy that for years lived in the dark. You know, we can trick each other, we can trick ourselves, but we cannot trick an all-knowing God. So it goes back to my earlier point about regularly examining ourselves with the Lord. How do you want to avoid hypocrisy in your life? Well, we must go to the great physician. We must go to the Lord to be examined. So when we go to him, we want to tell him the whole truth about our sin. What's the problem? What's the problem with our sin? We want to tell him about the suffering points and the pain points in our lives. So what's hurting? We want to tell him the truth about the things that we've tried to do in order to fix our problems. So what have I been doing to fix it? And finally, letting him take full control over sanctifying you. We are incapable of fixing ourselves or our sin, and only God can make us clean and help us to walk in truth and spirit. Many times we want to fix a private problem with a private solution, and as all of us know, that just doesn't work. So, Avoiding hypocrisy also comes with having humility as well. And I would think it would help us to not think of humility as someone who acts, you know, defeated and weak, because actually it's really the other end of the spectrum of someone who is self-righteous, right? You're just as selfish and acting that way as someone who is very prideful and very boastful about themselves. So humility, by definition, is having an accurate sense of ourselves before a holy and an all-knowing God. So something we can all start incorporating into our prayer life is asking God to examine us and to help us see what he sees and also having the humility to walk in a way that is godly. So being open and being honest about ourselves with him. And I know I'm not the only one in the room that this is speaking to. Uh, I know it's speaking to all of us. And sometimes we wanna separate ourselves from the attitude and the person of the Pharisees. We look at them as very self-righteous. We look at them as very legalistic, which in a lot of ways they are, but sometimes we can act just like them. We can be those people who strive to follow rules or extra biblical rules. And we can be people who judge quickly. You know, we can be people who wash the outside of the cup on a Sunday morning or Wednesday night. And we can find ourselves, you know, maybe counting our grains or our herbs before putting it into the offering plate. But that's the opposite of what God wants in our lives. Pastor John has mentioned this verse before, but Hosea 6, 6 says, for I desire mercy. In the New King James, it says mercy. If you're reading a different translation, like ESV, your Bible might say steadfast love. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So don't be hearers of the words. Don't be here or proposers of the word, but be doers of the word. So verse four, Jesus is now going to teach on fear. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that have no more that they can do, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. For not five sparrows, verse six, sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten by God. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. So Jesus had just finished speaking about the hypocrites, and he now turns his attention to reminding the disciples and is presumed those who are actually in the crowd of people with him to not fear who can kill the body. So many of the the hypocrites and the religious leaders will very soon be the ones who are going to kill Jesus. And later his disciples, with the exception of John, are also going to face very gruesome deaths for the gospel's sake, and they will become martyrs. As many of us know, some of these men, they're crucified, they're beheaded, they're ran through with a spear, they're filleted, which basically means you're boiled and your skin is peeled off your body. And they lay down their lives. Some of them are stoned. And millions of other people from that point up until present day have also laid down their lives for their faith. And Jesus tells them to not fear the one who can kill them in their earthly body, but fear the one who has the power to determine 
the eternity of their spiritual life and their spiritual body. Now, this word hell that you see here is a little bit different from the ones, from the other words of hell that we see throughout scripture. But this word hell is translated as Gehenna, or it can be translated as lake of fire. We see this in Revelation as well. So interestingly enough, this word Gehenna also has some geographical uh, meaning for it as well. If you guys re remember the Valley of Hanan, some of you might remember the god Molech. He's the god of the Ammonites in the Old Testament. We all know that uh, baby and infant sacrifice was done uh, on the altars of Molech. And in the times of Christ, scholars presume that that same area, this valley was actually used as a trash dump and it was perpetually on fire. So just a little context for you about this word Gehenna that Jesus is using here. But look what Jesus says here. And I, I love this. He uses even the most insignificant things like a bird, like a sparrow being sold. And he says to them that he doesn't even forget them. He doesn't even forget the insignificant things. So sparrows in that culture were cheap. They were inexpensive birds and people would use them to eat. If you were poor, you might be able to spare a couple coins to go and purchase uh, a sparrow to eat. So for those of you in here who might struggle with feeling secure, you might feel like you don't matter. You are cared about and Jesus cares so much about you. Every fiber of your being has been perfectly knit together by a loving God. He even knows every hair on your head is numbered. And clearly that's a fact that we cannot even comprehend ourselves, but God knows every single one of those hairs. And we are so much more valuable to him that he died to get, grant us eternal security. And if God didn't care so much, why would he do it? It's because God was so motivated by compassion and by love for you and I that it was worth doing to secure us back to him. That is such a beautiful promise that we can hold on to and remind ourselves that he does care about us. Verse eight, also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the son of man also will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So this can be quite a struggle and a hard point amongst believers. And I think a lot of the times we worry too much about what man thinks instead of really what God thinks. You know, we talk about that a lot in church and we are worried about, you know, coming under some sort of scrutiny or being canceled for our belief in Jesus Christ. And that might as well be the case. But Jesus is calling those in the crowd to make a choice here. He's asking them a question. He's saying, follow me or don't. And notice there is no gray area here. In fact, Jesus hates the gray area. Many of us know this verse. This is in Revelation 3, 15 to 16. It says, I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So if we really embrace our walks as believers before others, we will be bold to share our faith despite what they might think. Jesus just taught a few verses ago, not to fear man, but to fear God and that he cares for us. Again, something that we can think about when it comes to sharing our faith with others. It's more important to remember that we, we don't need to care about those who could possibly kill our bodies or who might cancel us or scrutinize us. It's more important what God thinks about it. Verse 10, and anyone who speaks a word against the son of man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. So a lot of people might worry that they've committed this sin as believers to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And if you're here and you're seeking after Jesus and desire, desiring him, that's proof that you haven't blasphemed the Holy Spirit or committed that sin. What this means is that the rejection of the Spirit is really an inward attitude of the heart. And this heart hates everything about the forgiveness that Jesus offers, and it doesn't even want the forgiveness at all. So the plain and simple way to not blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to accept the saving work that Jesus has done on the cross. Pretty plain and simple. Now, verse 11, when they bring you to the synagogues and the magistrates and the authorities, do not worry about 
how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So this is a promise that Jesus is giving before his actual death about the coming and the filling of the Holy Spirit. So we've seen verbiage like this throughout the New Testament of people who speak in the power of the Holy Spirit after Jesus passing. There are people like Peter and Paul uh, and others that spoke this way when they were brought before people of authority. So this word answer here in verse 11 in Greek is actually translated as apologia, which is meaning to give a defense. And it's also where we get the word apologetics, meaning giving a defense for your faith. So he's saying, don't worry about it. My spirit's going to speak and he's going to give you the words to say in that time. Continuing on, this is verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. So in Jewish tradition, two thirds of that inheritance was mostly given to the eldest son and anything that was left over was given to the son or whoever followed from that point. So the man in this scenario is in some ways has a right to that inheritance. And it doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't care what he's asking for, but the posture of this man's heart is more of a concern to Jesus here. So Jesus knows that his motives are bent towards pride. They're bent towards material possession. They're bent towards covetedness. And we know that covetous is another fancy word that we could use for idolatry, which is sin a sin that, you know, we as Americans know all too well. I've had a few conversations with my wife. Uh, if you don't know, my wife's from South Africa and her first few experiences in the States were sh shocking to her, seeing all the storage lockers and the houses and the attics and the basements filled to the brim. And for her, that was such a foreign concept to her that coming from a place of nothing, this set seemed ludicrous. Why do you need all this stuff? So much like this man, our material consumption, the things that we take in can cause us to be tight-fisted. It can cause us to be prideful, to covet what we have in our abundance or what someone else has in their abundance. And sometimes these luxuries that we have in our country can become idols in our lives and it can be a deterrent to our growth in Christ. Later in this book, we'll actually see this in the example of the rich young ruler. And he comes before Jesus and he says, Lord, I've kept every single one of your laws or all of the laws and the commandments since I was a boy. And Jesus turns and he says, there's one thing that I have you, sell all of your stuff and follow me. And we don't know what happens with this guy, but we can kind of assume that he wasn't able to do it, right? So I believe that it's important for us to be considering as we read this next section of scripture, what we might be holding on to that's keeping us from growing in our walks with the Lord. So if you look with me, this is verse 16. Then he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store my crops and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But verse 20, God said to him, fool, this night, your soul will be required of you, meaning that you are going to die tonight. Then those will those things be which you have provided. So where are they going to go? Verse 21. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So it's important as believers to be conscious of where we are storing our treasures. Our, our treasure should be stored in heaven and not here on earth. You know, if your house burnt down tomorrow and you know you're not getting anything back, would you be okay with that? Would you be okay if you lost everything? Would we still rejoice in the Lord when he has provided for us with a little or with a lot? When he gives, when he takes away, are we still able to rejoice in that? I think it's a telltale sign of where our hearts would be if something like that happened. A loss, no doubt,
But we do know from what we've been reading in scripture that God promises to take care of us and to provide for us more than we know. I love these follow-up verses to uh, this point. Verse 22, then he said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. And I love these verses right here. These are reasons not to worry. So for those of you in here who might be worriers and that might tend you to be anxious, here are the words of God right here. And I hope that they hit you in a fresh way and act as a blanket of security in your life. Verse 24, I love this verse. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of course, how much more valuable are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to a statue? So what are you going to gain by worrying? Verse 26, if you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies. This is imagery. This is a song right here. So I want you to turn this into a song. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And the idea of this little flock here is the most, you know, set apart, small runt flock here. That's, that's how it would be translated. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourself money bags, which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that do not fail, where no thief approaches nor moths destroy. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the Bible says, Matthew 6, 34, I love these verses. My mom used to tell this to us all the time growing up. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So we are not to worry and be anxious about what's to come, but we are to trust in the provision of God and his will. So what Jesus is saying here in verse 33 and 34, Jesus is saying, if you want to be free, from the bondage of wealth and possession. We know scripture says money is um, a root of evil. Jesus wants us to invest in the kingdom work and invest in the treasures in heaven that will never fade away. His word promises that. Everything that we have on this earth has a shelf life. You know, some of you might be thinking of that refrigerator that you bought from Kohl's 20 years ago and it was the best thing and it was running and then it died and you got a new one. And you're like, man, these things just aren't nearly as good as the old ones, but everything in this life, our cars, our clothes, everything has a shelf life. And I wonder what our families would look like if we modeled this attitude. So instead of chasing you know, the college degree, which is gonna get you a good job, it's gonna get you the benefits, the 401k, so you can retire at 65, what if we shifted our mindsets from focusing all that time and attention on those things over to where God wants our attentions and focus to be. You know, it might be America's dream, but it sure is not God's dream. So those things put the control back into our hands and they add a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety into our lives when we try to protect those things. And what does he say here? He says it in verse 20, he says, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And tonight could be our last night and all of those things are going to stay behind. And guess what? They're going to rot and they're going to fade away just like everything else. So what would our lives look like if our attitudes reflected believing what God tells us? He'll never leave us or forsake us. Consider the birds. Consider the lilies. He takes care of those things. What would our, our lives look like? He knows our needs. He knows our struggles. And he promises that he will take care of us better than we can actually take care of ourselves. I think we would see and actually feel a lot of the fruit of that. And I've seen that in my own life 
I've seen God provide in ways and move in ways that I wouldn't have expected him to move and provide. And no doubt there's plenty of you in here that have stories of similar things where the Lord provided and carried you through something that you did not think you were going to do. And you knew you couldn't do it in yourself either, but God takes care of us. I think it's a challenge to us as believers to cling a little bit harder to these promises and these truths that he's leaving here, this meat and potatoes that he's leaving for us. So just some closing remarks. When we read passages like these and we feel the spirit moving and convicting, I think one of the best things that we can do is come before the Lord. We can recognize who he is, you know, be reminded of how much he loves us, how much he cares about us, and ask him to help us rest in those promises of his word to really live these things out wholeheartedly and to walk in the righteousness that he calls us to and the godliness that he calls us to. So if you would, let's stand.